Okay, good afternoon everyone. Um, I think we are ready to continue uh, with the session number two. There might be some people coming in, but uh, we're already 50 minutes late, so let's start. Uh, we had a great session in the morning. Uh, we saw some evidence of, of occupational upgrade in, in several European countries and also, also some signs of uh, job polarization. Uh, then we talked also about the, the future of the um, working class and the middle class and how, how technological change will, will um, affect their future. Uh, we'll get back to this question in the uh, last session of today uh, in the um, panel discussion. Uh, this session number two is a little bit more policy orientated. Uh, we will hear thoughts on uh, what kind of role should the state have in, in promoting uh, high quality jobs. Uh, obviously this is, this is uh, what we want, but uh, the question remains what is the best way to create these jobs. Um, then we have also uh, here a presentation about time uh, which is, uh, at least for me, good to hear because we are uh, running out of time here. Uh, so basically, is it possible to work less and, and simultaneously uh, maybe improve our welfare? Uh, but the next speaker is a professor at the Tallinn University of Technology, uh, where he holds a chair of innovation policy and technological governance. He serves on several national and European commissions, such as European Science Foundation. Uh, he, he was elected to a full professorship at the age of 28 at the Tallinn University of Technology and is now one of the main protagonists of Estonia's innovation strategy and policy. And last year he received the Estonian National Science Award. So, please welcome Professor Rainer Kattel. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm pleased to be here. And um, I will try to be as quick as possible to, to gain some of the time we, we lost during, due to lively discussions and, and very good food. Um, so, I will talk about uh, the role of the state or policies institutions and high quality, high technology jobs. So I put them both here, high quality and high technology, because we very often, of course, when we mean high quality, we very often assume that they also have to be high technology. So that's why we very often look at the high technology, the new gadgets and new technologies as the source of our quality in, in job market as well. But we, as we already heard in the morning, this might not be the case at all. So technology actually can easily take some of the jobs away from us. And of course, even, even give us the robots to do most of, our, most of the work and thinking for us in the future probably. So, but I will, I will not go that far in the future. So I will say around our immediate uh, surroundings and our immediate future. And I will concentrate more or less on the European level. So it's not a talk about a Estonia or, or, or Finland or Scandinavia, but more on the European level issues, if you will. So the policies, prescriptions, uh, policy ideas that I'm going to talk about have to do with the European level and then also, of course, on the na nation state level. So, first of all, I think we, uh, we have this sort of a, an in, inborn juxtaposition in our policy debates about who should actually deliver the quality jobs to us? Is this the Sir Humphrey on the left of your screen? This is a fictional character. Uh, I'm sure some of you know him or have met him <laughs> in your real life because all governments have Sir Humphreys. These are highly educated civil servants who think who know much better than you do what is actually good for you. So essentially they are the robots of the latter day. So what <laughs> they did the thinking for you. So the big state, the big brother. And this is a, a British TV series which is called Yes Prime Minister and Yes, yes Minister. So Sir Humphrey essentially is what in English is called Mandarin. So the high level bureaucrats who run the show, who run the countries and politic, politicians are all the puppets. So on the, other, on the one hand, so we have Sir Humphreys, the big government. And of course, on the other hand, we have Steve Jobs, 
uh, as we know, is basically personally responsible for bankrupting Finland, almost, or so at least your prime minister seems to think. Uh, so anyway, we have this juxtaposition that there are either it's private sector or either it's, uh, it is the, it's the state. And usually, of course, these days, as, as I said, because we think high quality jobs means also high technology, we think that we all want, we need Steve Jobs. We need, everybody needs to have a Steve, Steve Jobs. All of these companies and all of this, even the government offices, the ministers, why don't you are as sexy as Apple? Because if you are not, then, well, you're not going to survive. So I think we have this, what I would think is actually a fake opposition, because in many ways, if you look about high quality, and also, but also high technology jobs, these are actually complementary, the private sector and the public sector. So I, there is a uh, very, uh, by now, I think, is a famous slide from Mariana Mazzucato. She published last year a book, which is called Entrepreneurial State, and this shows the main technologies that are within iPod and iPad, so within the technologies that bankrupted Finland. And if you look at this, this, yes, Steve Jobs had a very big role in developing and designing these products. But if you look here, Mariana Matsukata lists 13 technologies that are within your iPads or your iPhones that actually have been funded by the government. Mostly it has been the US government, but it also has been the German government, the UK government, and other governments who did all the basic research, mostly, of course, it was actually military research, so that we have to thank the Cold, for, Cold War for, for that. But still, it was a, you, have, you can see this TARPA, which is the U.S. Defense Agency, and, and you see also the NHS, which is the U.S. National Institute of Health and all that. So in many ways, what, you, what we have in our high-tech gadgets is actually supported by the government. So governments have been paying for that for decades, for a very long time. And of course, now we only sort of, as I said, look at and see only Apple and Steve Jobs here. But we also have to look more carefully and closely and see that there is actually a government also has been being a very important partner. So that's, I think, is my first point. If you think about high quality and also high technology, we have to think not only about highly dynamic companies and highly innovative companies, but we also have to think about government and its role funding research, funding development, be it military, be it environmental, whatever. Governments have, especially over the last 50 years, had an enormous role. So if you go on, uh, why, why there is a high technology tends to be uh, something that is very elusive over the recent maybe 30 years. So this is an, a value chain, again, of iPhone. So this is how the typical iPhone is put together. And the key number, actually, uh, I don't know whether, oh, can I point it in here? Yeah, oh yes, this one. The key number is actually here. This is the value added in China to a retail price of $600. So China adds $6. The value added, actually added in China, is very, very low. So this is not to say anything negative about China, but this is to show that even what looks like high technology production that looks like very complicated, what we would think high quality job, may not be actually very complicated or very high quality jobs. And as we heard in the morning, soon these jobs will be probably done by machines anyway, because they can be done by machines, probably even better than by 200,000 Chinese. So they can be even better. So this is just to highlight that high technology, it's a very elusive concept these days. And of course, I come from an Eastern European country, and actually we know that very well, because if you look at our expert figures, our expert figures for high technology are very, very high. But we, of course, again, the value-added content of our exports is actually very low, because we mostly work for German or Finnish or Swedish companies, and we put together either cars or phones or th th similar things like that. So our value-added content in these end products is actually very low. But statistically, it looks as if we are doing a lot of high-end manufacturing. And so this is the same here with the iPhone, just to exemplify that. What looks like high technology may actually not be very high technology at all. And indeed, I think there is a very good point to be made that many of these jobs will be in the near future taken over by machines. 
some sort of machines. As you know, Finland is a log logistics is a very important industry for Finland. As you know, in, in logistics, there is a lot of logistics is already being done only between machine and machine talking to each other. So there is already they got out the middleman, which is called man or woman. So they just got it out. So another thing before I go into more policy issues is that we have uh, again a research from Anne Markison from mid 1990s where she showed that some places what are what she called more sticky than others, in, in meaning that even if you have, again, a large-scale factory, it doesn't actually mean that you have a high-quality or a high-value-adding job. It might mean that you have, again, you e easily might have either branches or plants or outsourcing factories or thi similar things like that. So what matters is actually very much the structure of your industry in the city, in the country, or in the region you're in. So it just, just doesn't matter that you have a, a large-scale industry. Again, I can bring an example from my home country, Estonia. Estonia used to have one of our largest employees used to be in company Elkotec, I'm sure which you know here in Finland very well. It used to be one of the largest Finnish companies as well. So they used to employ a lot of people in Tallinn and they used to uh, produce around 100,000 mobile phones every week in Tallinn. But again, this was, they employed 3,000 people, so it used to be their highest uh, employer. So but this was actually very much this type of satellite platform. So we actually did not, if you look at the wages of these workers, if you go 15 years ago, they were actually minimum wage wages. And minimum wage in Estonia 15 years ago was very small. So again, even if it looks like high technology production, it actually may not be that at all. So we have to way, go way beyond statistics and, and all of that and actually understand the value change and the way that geographically your production networks are set up because this is what gives you the agglomeration effects and all of these issues that you actually want to have in your city, in your region, in your country. So now we're getting closer to something that uh, I want to talk about more in detail. But this is a, a, a survey by, uh, oh sorry, I went on, uh, by Lundval and Lawrence and others who have, they have used European labor survey and so they want to get away from this high technology, high quality equation and look more detail into what kind of work people actually do. So European labor survey, this asks uh, thousands and thousands of people working in various industries and services the question of, of, of what kind of task are you doing and so the oh sorry again uh, so the key is actually how many problems you have to solve yourself or you actually send the problems upstairs to the managers so all of these kind of issues uh, and about norms and autonomy in, in workplace and so this is what they look at and they come up with four types of essentially organizations in Europe and one of them is this is the discretionary learning, or what we can call is a learning organizations where workers have a very high rates of responsibility. So if there is a shop floor, they produce something, they produce from phones or whatever they produce. And if there are problems, these are the workers who have to solve the problem. But these are this type of learning organizations. So there is very high level of uh, uh, complexity, very low on monotony. So the tasks are not repetitive. Tasks are actually changing because they have to constantly learn how to solve problems. And so this is the learning organizations and they're lean production, and tailorist and traditional. So, and then of course, if you go here, especially the monotony or repetitive of task, they get higher and higher and higher, the, the sort of the lower you go in terms of organization. So I would argue that if we think about organizations, the companies we want to have, we want to have companies that are very high here, that they have complexity, problem solving, but also the autonomy of methods, autonomies, uh, uh, and all of these issues. So where workers are actually not constrained by the management, by their environment. So they have the large independence to solve problems. So what we, would can, what we can call learning organizations. And this research is actually very interesting because you can put the European countries on it. So I've taken here the same learning organizations. How many of your organization in your country are learning organizations where workers have a high extent of uh, independence in solving problems. And here I've just taken labor productivity, and this is for one year, so it's actually way back. But it gives you an indication, and especially it gives you an indication because this is actually before the crisis uh, started in 2008. So it actually gives you something to think about. So here I have a, a three types of economies, so now you can guess 
which countries go where. So first of all, we have here this flexible security countries, countries that actually export more than they import, they have high wage e economies. Here we have economies that have been sort of, ladders are being kicked away from them. They cannot grow anymore, although they get, their productivity seems to be growing, but they don't have actually learning organizations. And here we have very open e economies that have very, a lot of foreign investors, a lot of exports, but they also import much more and they have low wages. So, can you guess which countries go where? Where would Finland be? Yes, it would be up here. So we can start, uh, I guess you're, you're, you're uh, more still in the restaurant part of the <laughs> talk. So, yes, we get actually, surprisingly, we get Spain, Greece, Portugal, Slovak Republic, Czech Republic, and actually Eastern European countries tend to be around here. So you have, than it, rather than here, so they have a lower productivity than the Southern European countries, but they have much lower share of learning organizations. So they have sort of Tayloristic mass production organizations where workers are not supposed to solve problems, but they're supposed to do repetitive tasks all the time, the same things. So simple menial jobs, as we would say almost. So and here you would of course have Fer Germany, Finland, Netherlands, Swe and of course Sweden high up there, which has been the case for Finland over the last hundred years, I guess. So you have a big brother next to you and learning from that. So what I would call is a valley, is this a valley of theft within European Union? So you have really a, a middle income economies where most of the workers actually are not engaged in organizations where they have to learn every day on their job. So they can do the job for that they learned 20, 30, 40 years ago. So they just do the more or less the similar jobs for a very long period of time. And at the same time here, you have Eastern European economies that actually have a very high share of these types of organizations, but they are somehow not getting the productivity growth. So there is something also wrong there. And of course, we know what is wrong there, because if you think about the sticky places, Eastern European countries are not very sticky for very high wage jobs. So we do the sort of the more simple tasks for these companies in Germany, in Finland, in Sweden. And we, that's why there, is, there seems to be within European Union what I would call this valley of death. That's why only few countries are doing well within European Union and actually many countries around the core northern countries are actually having difficulties because they cannot get the same type of dynamic in industrial or service economies growing as the, the northern economies. And of course, this sort of leads me to the policy prescription because I think European Union, if you look at it, has an issue with industrial policy, because we think about industrial policy in a, in a very old-fashioned terms, and we haven't really uh, adjusted to the new information technology world, I think, where we have to think very differently about uh, uh, industrial policy, I think. I think European Union needs an industrial policy, it needs a new type of industrial policy. I also think European Union needs to look much more carefully at uh, labor market regulations and at la labor market as such, and labor market policy, and I think also the European Union needs to look at financial reform much more carefully than we have done before. So essentially, these are my three areas I think European Union as a whole, but also member countries, would need to look much more carefully perhaps than we have done before. And, oh, there was Estonia as well. Sorry, <laughs> I wasn't done. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So, and, and this is the reference if you're interested. This is Holm at, at all. Uh, and I, I use state data and then data from Eurostat. So anyway, so... I, what we want to have is, of course, learning organizations. So we want to have as many companies in Finland, Estonia, France, wherever they are, be learning organizations where there's a lot of discretionary power for the workers to decide how to solve problems. This, of course, is incredibly difficult because imagine you're, as an owner, you have to trust people who don't own your company, so they don't own, they don't have a skin in the game, so to say, but you have to trust them. So this is a very difficult uh, situation, especially because it sort of ne means that you have to put together public policies and also the firm, firm level policies. So what I want to highlight here before I get into policies is that actually what we have in modern type of societies are highly complex coordination issues. And since we don't really want to move towards very much the planned economies, um, although if you believe that robots are taking over, we have to probably move more, much more towards planned economies than before, but still, I think we, uh, once we remain in this type of networked, half 
public half private economies as we are these days, we need to have we need to solve very complex coordination issues somehow. And so I would propose that there are, as I said, there are three sets of issues that the government should really look at. And first of all, it's something that, that we would really look at uh, as a new industrial policy that is much more concentrated towards the fusion of knowledge and not so much actually creating of this knowledge. So we don't really need to go back into thinking we want to have national champions and things like that because there is so much new knowledge in services in software, in industries being created, especially for us in the small economies that we are here, it is actually much more about diffusing this knowledge and actually getting this knowledge into, into sectors like healthcare, uh, elderly care, and all of these areas where we have large parts of our uh, GDP is actually in, large parts of our, our even, uh, uh, employment is in. So we need to have the diffusion of this uh, knowledge that is out there and that, uh, this is where I think the regulatory standards, which we set in, for instance, in healthcare, but also in many other in environmental issues, many other industries are so important. And this is where public policies become important. So, how do you set standards in healthcare? What type of, you know, if you, if I now I got sick last week, if I went to my family doctor, I gave a blood test. So, how is this blood being actually worked? Because we have a very traditional method, which is that the blood is literally, they, it grows somewhere in the laboratory and say, then they see, you know, what type of things grow in my blood. And then they come back to you and they say, well, you have flu. But of course we can also do it via genetically tested new tests. So we can look at these new tests and see what type of virus you actually have and much more quickly. This, of course, de demands a public sector intervention. Public sector, Minister of Health or whatever, has to say, well, you can only test Genetically, you, you don't need to do it anymore in a traditional way. But this is a way how you can push the diffusion of knowledge because this knowledge is out there or is, or is being created as we speak. So can, you can push the diff diffusion of knowledge into other sectors. It doesn't need to be that your family doctor is inventing this type of genetic testing. She needs to be able to use it. So this is why I think the, the regulatory standards are such an important way to push new knowledge into the especially into the service economy. But I also think that procurement of innovations is a very uh, important issue, especially for European economies, especially those economies in the Eurozone, because we do not have monetary and even not anymore fiscal independence. So we don't, we don't have a, a recourse. We cannot just go back to the central bank and we, we just can, as a government, and ask for more money. We have to actually do it in a much more restrictive monetary and fiscal space. But if you look at the a normal government in European Union spends almost 20% of its GDP via procurement every day, every year, every month. So we spend a lot of money already on procuring service construction, but also all kinds of services that we have to, by law, procure. So I think governments have enormous resources at their disposal to use for pushing innovations, pushing technological advances, but pushing also regulatory change. Because, of course, if you do a procurement, if you pro procure a construction, you as a government can set the requirements, what this building has to do, how energy efficient it is. And, of course, then you can think, where does this energy efficiency come from? Are my companies in Helsinki or in Tallinn capable of actually winning this bet or not? If they are not capable, well, then you have to go back and work with them. So the idea is that you can, via public procurement, you can do a lot of, because there is a lot of money in public procurement. But of course, it requires, in a way, it requires Sir Humphreys, people who are very smart also in the public sector. So that's why I think there is a, a lot of needs to be done with the public sector and private sector together. Next thing, I think, is uh, if you go to the especially in smaller economies, I think the diversity of home markets, because many of us have a very uh, thin, in, in that sense, industrial sectors by now, because so much of it, it is produced somewhere else, especially for the Eastern European and Southern European countries. But also increasingly, of course, for Finland, you are also losing industrial jobs. So the question is about diversity of your economies. How much you can produce here is very, very important. And here I think the high wage issue that 
you don't actually give in to lower wages and, and demands for lower wages, I think is in, incredibly important because high wages mean also that you actually keep alive domestic services, very local services, very localized services that nobody else can produce because something that can be produced cheaply will be also produced cheaply and, as we heard in the morning, will be produced in the future by machines. So you want to be in a business that cannot be produced cheaply, but can be only produced here in Finland, in Helsinki. This also, of, co of course, in many ways has to do with people, because it has to do with uh, social services and other these type of services, but also with, with uh, a, a, a more luxury goods or luxury services, if you will, so that has to be provided here. So I think in that sense, high wages are actually prerequisite for small-scale niche services that are only available here in Helsinki or Tampere or whatever you are, but these depend on high wages. If you don't have high wages, you cannot have these services. And, but I also think that um, uh, various type of employer of last resort pro programs are actually very important in our age. And these programs mean that essentially government employs everybody who is unemployed. Because I think one of the key lessons we should take away from recent European crises and also what happened in the US is that macroeconomic policies won't trickle down to the most poorest of people. This is a, a sort of a, now we do it in a very roundabout way and we look at the government balance, budget balance and say, if the government does not have too high deficit, at one point we will have full, almost full employment. I don't think it works like that at all, and I think we have ample evidence that it doesn't really work like that at all. So we actually need to look at different types of ways, is it the basic income or is it the employer of last resort program, to actually deal with unemployment. So now we deal with unemployment in a very expensive way by the welfare state and all of these issues, which is a very expensive way of doing that, and especially via macroeconomic stability issues. We think that if we have low inflation, that's why poor will get a job, which is never going to happen, I think. So I think employer left is short, where government actually employs people, and if people want to get higher wages, they have to go to different jobs, to private sector or, or government uh, jobs, I think is, is really very important. And we have actually evidence from Argentina and India and other places that this type of very low-level employment, so basically people are employed by the government around minimum wage, a bit higher, is actually a very efficient way because once we, we all again talked about in the morning about the gender issues and so on. This is actually a way uh, to keep um, or to activate, to empower women to go to the work market, to actually get away from home and actually be much more independent. So I think these type of uh, employer of last resort programs in that sense are very, very important also. Perhaps not so much in the very developed countries like Finland, but there are other places. Uh, I think also the issue is, of course, how do we pay for that all? How do we, you know, because we are in the Eurozone, we are in the very res restricted uh, um, monetary and fiscal policy area, so how do we pay for that? And I think here we have really forgotten why we have financial sector. So we really think that the financial sector is there to make money for banks. But of course, this is highly, highly unusual situation, because usually, mostly in the capitalism economies, we have banks to serve what we call the real economy, to serve the investment needs of companies, to serve the investment needs also of the governments. So I think we have to really very carefully think about how do we reform our public sector, our banking sector, our financial sector. And I think here, again, Europe actually has a very, very good historical lesson. We have a very good lesson with public development banks. Most European banks used to be public development banks. Actually. So we have a very strong... Uh, uh, and positive uh, feedback here. But if you even, in terms of public venture capital, I think uh, now we have a situation where, for instance, in the Nordic area, every government has their own small public venture capital fund. We have one in Finland, we have one in Sweden, we have one in Estonia. But of course, it would be much logical to have a Nordic public venture capital fund that sort of leverages uh, much more, and is also that's why it's more able to invest more. So I think public financial institutions are something that we are, we are sort of by now genetically almost afraid of because we have heard for 30 years that the public sector is somehow bad in dealing with the economy. So we have got grown used to the idea that public sector has to always get out of the economy. But I think 
public sector will always remain very important. In the, we cannot get away from that, and we shouldn't really. We should just try to make it better. And so I think public financial institutions are very important, but also segmented banking sector. Most European economies, actually, except for Germany, basically, used to have, after the World War II, highly segmented banking sector. So you had banks that were not allowed to deal with, for instance, real estate, but they had to deal with industry. So almost every country in the European Union, what is now European Union, used to have highly segmented banking sector. That also meant that these banks were, of course, much smaller, but they dealt with investment. They did not deal with speculative uh, assets. They did not deal with uh, 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 bubbles and all these things. So they, th these things, highly segmenting bank, uh, banking sector, I think is, again, something that we, we need to look into more carefully. Uh, and I think also something that we haven't looked at the into at all almost is that the public sector can guarantee a lot of these investment functions in the banks. Now we are only thinking about deposit guarantee. So we, all of us think that if there is a financial crisis, Finnish government and the French government or the Estonian government has to, to a certain degree, it has to guarantee the deposits that all of us have in the banks. But of course, I mean, we all know that in the future, banks are actually going to be robots, so we don't actually need any more banks as a middleman. We already have a, a growing number of these financial intermediaries. PayPal, for instance, is essentially an um, a intermediary where you really don't need a bank in, in, in the middle. So you don't need to actually guarantee this function anymore because you can basically public, make it public altogether. So once you say that all accounts in the PayPal are, are secure, you don't really need to look at it anymore, but you need to look at the investment function of banks. So how do you get, how do you get banks to, to invest into long-term activities? And this is, I think, is, is where um, public guarantees and public sector becomes a much more important. So these three areas of industrial policy where procurement, I think, for me, offers a, a very good uh, uh, opportunities. Also diversity of all markets, especially securing a, a relatively high level of income, but also an employer of last resort programs where we really employ everybody who wants to be employed. If people don't want to be employed, fine, let them be whatever they are. Maybe there are people like that. I'm sure there are people like that. And reform the financial sector, I think, because finance is really not serving the real economy at all uh, almost anymore. If you look at these days, European Union is literally, quite literally, actually printing money, but investments are not actually increasing. So there is something does not give in the financial sector and in the way we regulate it. So, but here I finish, so because my time is up as well. So thank you very much. Once again, we can take one brief question at this point, and it's the gentleman over there. Have I, Mark Wetherlin, have I understood correctly that the former socialist um, economies like Hungary, Czech, Poland, that they are, so to say, hinterland of, the, of, of, of Germany, yes. that the German, mainly German and West European Yes. Um, companies make their bulk products, products yes. in these countries, like like refrigerators, or so autos, and so. On. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you look at this in European, uh, you have a uh, if you take Germany, Czech Republic, and Hungary, they are actually the largest trading partners of each other. But also, if you think Estonia, the largest trading part of partners of Estonia are of course Finland and Sweden. And this is largely actually the inter-firm or inter-value uh, chain trading going on. So it's not uh, really, you know, same similar types of companies uh, doing uh, trading with each other. So yes, you can see the Eastern European countries as very much as an hinterland of the of the wealthy, the really the core European Union countries. All right, we will get back to questions for Rainer Kattel later on.